Welcome to the Center for Environmental Excellence's Environmental Justice Webinar. All lines have been placed in a listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. You may submit a question during the webinar by typing it into the chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen. We will be taking live questions at the end of today's presentation. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad to reach a live operator. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Melissa Savage. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Savage, and I am the Director of the Center for Environmental Excellence at AASHTO. Welcome to the first convening of the Environmental Justice Community of Practice. Before we begin, um, I want to put up a slide to show you some quick resources for you on this webinar. Um, the first is if you have any questions at any time throughout the webinar, please don't hesitate to enter them into this chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen, and we will, we will do our best to answer those as we go. Also, there is a media library located um, in the upper right-hand um, corner that looks like a yellow piece of paper with a blue bar graph in front of it. Um, we have additional resources that, have we, that we have placed there, so I would encourage you to look uh, there once um, as, we, as we go. Um, the, the webinar will be archived within one week, and when it's ready, you will receive notice of the archive along with a link to access it. The agenda for today's webinar will include a quick overview about the Center for Environmental Excellence and this community of practice. We will also hear an update from Samantha Hoylett, a program coordinator for environment at ASHO, and she'll give a brief update on some of the work that has been done through the Center on Environmental Justice. We'll also hear an update from Federal Highway, Fleming LME, uh, with the Office of Human Environment and Livability. We'll provide an update on some of their resources and work that has been um, undertaken through Federal Highway. Following Fleming, we will hear from John Sherrill with the Illinois DOT, who will give us uh, just a a brief case study discussion about residents in the transportation right of way. Um, we also, as the operator mentioned, will open the lines up for discussion, um, as well as being able to text in any questions that you have in the text box I mentioned earlier. So a little bit about the Center for Environmental Excellence. The center was developed by ASHO in cooperation with the Federal Highway Administration in 2001 and has as its mission to promote environmental stewardship and encourage innovative ways to streamline the transportation delivery process. On our website, we offer a wealth of information for environmental and transportation practitioners. Please visit our homepage at environment.transportation.org to sign up for our weekly website update email. Another feature of interest is our broadcast emails. The periodic updates announce new center products and programs and be, can be customized to meet your priorities. The work of the center is overseen by a technical working group comprised of state DOT practitioners representing a diverse background and interest. Representatives from the Federal Highway Administration, representatives from resource agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as staff from the selection of metropolitan planning organizations and university transportation research centers. The technical working group meets annually to determine the center tasks. This year, the technical working group identified six areas of focus, including two communities of practice, one on stormwater management and this one on environmental justice. The primary goal of both of these communities' practice is to provide a gathering point for practitioners on these important issues and a way to regularly engage through webinars, conference calls, and other online forums in order to share best practices and lessons learned. Our consultant on this task, the State Tribal Institute at the National Conference of State Legislatures, or NCSL, is on the call today and will capture the discussion that we have so that we'll have a record of the lessons learned as well as any ideas for action items the center can take on for this community of practice. On that note, as we move through the series of webinars and additional follow-up work relating to this community of practice, the State Tribal Institute at NCSL, will, as well as the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, will help the center in organizing webinars, communicating with the members of this communi community, and ensuring outreach to key stakeholders. Likely, in the lead-up to this webinar, you received email messages from Martha Salazar with NCSL, and she will continue to help to manage our outreach and work associated with this community of practice. 
If you have any questions about the community practice, please do not hesitate to contact Samantha Hoylett, the lead st ASHA staff working on the task. Her contact information and mine will be li listed later on in this webinar. And please feel free to contact us at any time. As I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is the first in a series that we will conduct this year. We will look to members of this community for input on the topics for the next webinars, and we'll also turn to work conducted through the Center last year, which yielded an environmental justice roadmap. In a few minutes, my colleague Samantha Hoylett will provide additional information and details about the work that was conducted last year and ways the community of practice can leverage the roadmap to help guide the engagement over the next few months. And now, with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter, Samantha. Samantha, as I mentioned earlier, is a program coordinator in the environment program here at ASHO. And she oversees other projects through the center and works closely with the ASHO Committee on Environment and Sustainability. Samantha? Thank you, Melissa, and good morning, everyone. And thank you again for joining us. So in February 2016, the center hosted an environmental justice peer exchange for around 30 participants. The participants were from DOTs, MPO, and FHWA. This unique collaboration focused on seeking effective solutions and considering environmental justice during the planning and project development of transportation facilities. So by organizing the thoughts shared, the center began working on an environmental justice peer exchange roadmap. And while the roadmap was being developed, we also hosted a webinar discussing the results of the peer exchange and key issues that the EJ roadmap could cover. On that webinar, we had around 350 participants, so we also decided to conduct some polls to get the most information out of them as possible. And so the results of some of those polls are also included in the roadmap. The roadmap identified eight focus areas, and within each identified the current state of the practice, key issues, and potential strategies and benefits to practitioners. For example, one of the focus areas was EJ data and analysis, the topic of our webinar today. In the orange image, there are four strategies that were developed on how this part of the state of the practice could be improved. The strategies include develop guidance on consistency of data, research how transportation agencies are determining disproportionate impacts, develop tools to standardize evaluation of disproportionate impacts, and adapt methods to changing demographic data and exploring new methods of obtaining data. So consider keeping these strategies in mind as we hear from our presenters today. Now I would like to show you the center website where the roadmap and other resources are stored. So what you see here is the front page. These, the slides here um, update with topical case studies on a range of topics. To view the topics you are interested, view this environmental topic tab. For example, in the environmental justice top here. To find the roadmap that I discussed earlier, Simply click on Products and Programs. Then you can click on Conference and Workshop Materials. You can see EJ Peer Exchange is first on the list. In this list, you can find the agenda, presentations, the roadmap, and the webinar recording can all be found. To find up-to-date information regarding this community of practice, return to the Products and Programs tab and click Communities of Practice Forum. Here in a bulleted list, you will find the EJ recordings, resources, and other materials related to this community of practice. With that, I will now pass it off to Fleming, who will be providing an FHWA Environmental Justice Resources Overview. Fleming? Great. Thank you, Samantha. As mentioned previously, I'm Fleming Elamin, and I work as a community planner with FHWA's Office of Human Environment. Uh, my subject areas are environmental justice and context and solutions. And I'll just take a few moments to provide you with an update of some of our EJ resources. 
Okay, starting out, I just wanted to um, give an overview of um, how we address environmental justice at uh, Federal Highway Administration. Um, environmental justice, or EJ, as I'll refer to a lot throughout the presentation, um, means identifying and addressing disproportionately high and adverse effects of the agency's programs, policies, and activities on minority populations and low-income populations. It is FHWA's longstanding policy to actively ensure non-discrimination in fund federally funded activities. And to that end, we continuously work to identify and prevent discriminatory effects by administrative programs, policies, activities that ensures social impacts to communities and people are recognized early in the process and throughout the decision-making um, process from, pro from planning to implementation. Uh, we do this through uh, building capacity and knowledge on environmental justice through the development of resources such as workshops, research, peer networks, and outreach programs. Okay, so just wanted to quickly give uh, some information on our key policy references as it relates to environmental justice. Um, these key policies um, kind of frame and guide our efforts on environmental justice. Uh, first and foremost, the Executive Order uh, 12898, signed by President Clinton in 1994, requires that each federal agency make achieving environmental justice a part of its mission. Uh, that includes identifying and addressing uh, disproportionately high and adverse uh, human and health and environmental effects of our programs, policies, and activities as, on minority populations and low-income populations. Um, the dates of the um, uh, directives and uh, policies on the screen were not the initial dates. Those are the most recent updates. So following the um, uh, executive order, uh, USDOT and FHWA uh, issued separate uh, directives related to how we would go about uh, integrating environmental justice throughout the transmission decision-making process and establishing policies and procedures to comply with the executive order. The environmental justice uh, strategy, uh, which is a DOT strategy, uh, sets the, the framework for how we'll go about um, integrating the principles of environmental justice and programs. Um, the original strategy was adopted in 1995 and most recently updated uh, in November of, of last year. Um, all these uh, references are available on FHWA's environmental justice website. Um, and so in terms of how we um, continue to support environmental justice, I uh, mentioned previously we have been actively involved with uh, AASHTO Center for Environmental Excellence and working towards implementation of the Environmental Justice Roadmap. Uh, we're also in, involved in doing uh, some national um, research on environmental justice, which I'll uh, detail in a little later in the presentation. Um, and we also work uh, to develop uh, new and current case studies at the state and regional level to highlight how environmental justice uh, effectively addresses, um, is incorporated in the transportation decision-making process. Um, just real quickly, a few things as far as collaboration groups. Uh, FHWA has an ongoing environmental justice working group that we meet uh, every other month. Also, DOT, uh, US DOT um, has a working group that has um, all the modes under DOT, and we collaborate on training and, and, and resource development as well. And um, in addition to that, uh, uh, there's a federal interagency working group on environmental justice that comp is comprised of 17 federal agencies and White House offices, um, and we also collaborate on the development of environmental justice resources and, and training. Um, each year, we report on our major environmental justice activities that have been undertaken, and we develop an annual action plan um, for uh, the activities we'll undertake for the next calendar year. So real quickly, um, as I mentioned, we have a number of resources um, on the screen. You see some of the ones we are uh, recently published. Um, just real quickly, uh, we do have some that are currently underway that I'll mention just very briefly. Uh, we have a study on environmental justice analysis and transportation planning and programs, state of the practice. Uh, this study will take a look at how EJ data collection uh, and analysis, as well as identification of EJ populations occur uh, during the transportation planning process and give some best case e examples and give some really uh, good information on um, how environmental justice in is incorporated during the planning process. 
Um, additionally, we have another study that is uh, looking specifically at changing demographics and the implication for transportation practitioners as it relates to environmental justice analysis, identifying environmental justice populations as demographics are changing, and how to actually go about identifying adverse and disproportionately high and adverse impacts when a, a community is either majority minority or low income or changing to a majority minority uh, community. And finally, um, we also are updating our Community Impact Assessment Guidebook, also known as the Purple Book, um, and this will provide new and updated resources for assessing the impact of proposed transportation projects and activities on communities, and it will include some uh, best practices as, as well. Uh, the website provided at the bottom of the screen, um, you can access all the recently published um, resources. Uh, there's no shortage of resources. These, uh, again, are some additional resources uh, that are uh, available through um, the USDOT uh, website, FHWA's website, as well as the Transportation Research Board. Uh, we all ha collectively have quite a bit of resources that help state and local partners with public engagement, equity considerations in all phases of transportation decision making, um, and you can get links to any of these reports on the websites I just mentioned. Uh, one resource in particular I want to mention is our Environmental Justice uh, Reference Guide. This was published a couple of years ago now, uh, but it, it is our go-to guide in regards to how we um, assist uh, states and local partners in understanding how FHWA uh, complies with the EJ requirement. Um, it also has a lot of information on how environmental justice is considered in all phases of transportation uh, decision making. Um, it also includes EJ data collection and analysis resources, including methodologies and key questions to ask uh, as you start your analysis process. Uh, also, uh, wanted to mention last summer, uh, FHWA's Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty facilitated uh, at what we call the EJ Screening Tools Virtual Peer Network. Uh, it was a voluntary effort where we, um, uh, several practitioners uh, from state DOTs and MPOs uh, provided their uh, input on several EJ screening tools or analysis tools. Um, these included um, environmental justice uh, or, or the EJ screen, American Fact Finder, um, as well as the American Community Survey, um, in addition to locally uh, developed screening tools um, <clears throat> through the North Texas, excuse me, the North Central Texas Council of Governments, the Atlanta Regional Commission, and the Miami-Dade Transportation Planning Organization. Um, there's a link to uh, both the webinars that were uh, recorded as a part of this process, as well as a summary report that kind of details the pros and cons of these areas, uh, EJ screening tools, and provided some uh, feedback um, based on how we as transportation, transportation practitioners can use these uh, resource tools. I um, also wanted to make mention of um, one of the tools that we have here at FHWA called PlanWorks. It is a web-based resource that supports collaborative decision making in transportation planning and project development. Uh, it is a built around key decision points in long-range transportation planning and programming including corridor plans and the environmental review process. Um, it, you know, once you put your uh, information in, it, it provides suggestions on when and how to better incorporate or engage partners and stakeholders, uh, including environmental justice populations, to help build consensus through each of the processes. It has four components. There's a decision guide, there's an assessment tool, applications, and a resource library. And it basically helps practitioners to identify and overcome barriers when they plan uh, or, or, or when plans hit roadblock. Um, and it has detailed information on um, and resources related to how to improve decision making through all the uh, various processes. I think I may have mentioned previously we do have uh, numerous case studies on our uh, environmental justice website, um, and they are. It, at various stages, um, we have how environmental justice was incorporated during the planning phase, the project development, uh, in public involvement, uh, right of way and acquisition, um, as well as operation and maintenance. So we have uh, we try to cover how environmental justice is um, highlighted or integrated into each phase of transportation decision making. Uh, through our uh, office of uh, project development and environmental review, there's an environmental toolkit. 
Uh, it's a one-stop shop or uh, information resource that provides up-to-date information on environmental policy, guidance, regulations, and best practices. Um, there's also information on um, environmental justice and NEPA guidance, uh, which provides information on how to identify adverse impacts and the steps to take um, to determine if they're disproportionate kind of adverse and uh, gives you a rundown of the documentation requirements based on the findings. Uh, also, we have a number of training resources, which I'll go over just really briefly. Uh, the National Highway Institute is a training and education arm of FHWA. Uh, we currently uh, just released last month uh, a new four-hour web-based training uh, titled The Fundamentals of Environmental Justice. Um, it is free to practitioners and provides information on how environmental justice applies to each stage of transportation decision-making, and um, folk, uh, participants are presented with a variety of strategies and resources to consider environmental justice through each phase. We also have an instructor-led uh, course uh, on fundamentals of environmental justice. Uh, some of the content is the same, but the in-person course allows for interagency collaboration and in-person networking. Um, additionally, we're working to develop a, a more intermediate level course called environmental justice analysis. Uh, it'll be instructor-led, in-person, and provide on-hands experience uh, doing the analysis during planning and project development. Uh, once that course is online, the, the in-person fundamentals course will go away, so we'll have the web-based course um, as an entry-level course, and then the more intermediate environmental justice analysis course, which we expect to be available by next fall. Um, additionally, our resource center provides uh, training. Uh, we, our, our civil rights and environmental realty teams of the resource center provide technical assistance on environmental justice related to NEPA and non-discrimination in transportation. Uh, the Resource Center also has a course titled Title VI, Preventing Discrimination in the Federal Aid Program, which is, discusses how environmental justice in, is incorporated into FHWA's non-discrimination program and its relationship to Title VI. Uh, lastly, uh, the Federal Transit Administration through the National Transit Institute offers two courses in environmental justice, an intro course and a, an advanced environmental justice workshop, and both are offered two to three times per year. Uh, I was just to transition just really quickly, um, since this webinar is on uh, EJ analysis, I wanted to just provide very quickly some uh, federal resources on EJ um, uh, data collection. Uh, first being the uh, American Community Survey, which I've mentioned before. It's an ongoing survey that provides uh, vital national data on a yearly basis. Um, and is a good source to get uh, basic demographic information at the municipal, county, and state level. Um, the American Fact Finder allows users to drill down and obtain specific statistics and create uh, customized data tables as well as customized maps. Um, drilling down a little further, the um, American Community Survey uh, public use microdata samples uh, are most useful if you need to create tables that are not available through American Fact Finder. Um, then we also have uh, the um, Census Transportation Planning uh, Products, um, which are created and designed by transportation planners using large samples of um, survey data con conducted by the Census Bureau. Uh, and there are actually, this information is available uh, as residential-based tabulations. Uh, they have information on workplace, uh, travel modes, workflows, um, and also the characteristics of uh, commuting patterns. Additionally, we also, uh, through the uh, American survey, there are specific environmental justice profiles. Uh, these actually uh, provide information on race and ethnicity, poverty statistics, information on elderly populations uh, and persons with disability. Um, this particular table um, is available on FHWA's Office of Planning Census Data website. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to just mention that um, we also have information on poverty through the Department of Health and Human Services uh, poverty guidelines. Um, we basically, uh, FHWA defines um, low income as it relates to identifying EJ populations from the, um, the, the poverty guidelines as established by the Department of Health and Human Services. So you can go to this website that's illustrated on the uh, screen uh, to get more information on that. Um, these are published annually, and so we do have the 2017 uh, guidelines. 
Um, and also on our environmental justice website, you can find more information on specifically how FHWA defines both minority and low income. A few other federal resources. Um, as I mentioned previously, one of the, the tools that was uh, looked at or, uh, or, or um, discussed during the uh, peer network was the EJ screen. It is developed by the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. Um, it's a, a mapping and screening tool that provides national data sets and approaches for combining environmental and demographic uh, indicators related to EJ populations. Um, it allows you, it's, it's a national um, in, in terms of its scope and where you can actually drill down to get specific data information on the areas that are most uh, of interest to you. Um, there's also been an update in terms of how, um, based on some of the feedback that we've provided on the, 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 the scale at which you can actually re retrieve um, data. So I would encourage you to take a look at that website if you haven't had an opportunity to. Also, in addition to EPA's product, um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has a mapping tool that provides demographic information on housing, race, national origin, uh, language, isolation, um, and information on access to jobs for every community development block grant area in the country. Um, and to get additional information, I would encourage everyone to sign up for um, our um, newsletters. We have two newsletters. One is the bi-weekly uh, e- uh, or um, electronic newsletter called the HE Digest. Um, and then quarterly, we have a livability newsletter. Both of these products actually provide updates on our environmental justice activities as, as well as other relevant activities um, that our office is involved with. And uh, to get information on upcoming webinars, uh, additional resources that are going to be rolling out. Um, you can subscribe to uh, either of these, uh, but in terms of the Human Environment Digest, that is a, um, uh, was emailed uh, bi-weekly, and it just keeps you up to speed on um, everything that, that we have going on as far as development of resources, trainings, peer networks, um, and, and the like. Uh, so lastly, um, this is our uh, office and program websites, or you can obtain additional information on all of the resources I have um, mentioned. Um, the top one, Environmental Justice, has just about a link to every resource I've, I've, I've mentioned, um, as well as some of the other program um, uh, office, excuse me, program and office websites uh, for additional information. Um, here are also our contacts per uh, the offices. Uh, for additional um, information as well. And with that, I will turn it over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Fleming. Uh, good morning. My name is John Sherrill. I work for the State of Illinois for the Illinois Department of Transportation. My responsibilities involve uh, transportation projects, uh, which include roadways, pedestrian and bicycle paths, and railroads, railroad projects. We have quite a few in Illinois. And my job is to ensure projects are compliant with the National Environmental Policy Act and specifically for socioeconomic issues, specifically environmental justice. The title of this is a brief case study that currently involved with the city of Chicago. And we're, I titled it Residents in a Transportation Right Away. And I use the term residents as opposed to people in a transportation right away. And this, uh, this project involves substantial repairs to the substructures of two bridges that are located in downtown Chicago. And these bridges are part of Lakeshore Drive. You may have heard of Lakeshore Drive. It's a famous roadway in Chicago. And uh, these substructures, you can see Lakeshore Drive is on the top. And this is West Lawrence Avenue that goes that goes under Lakeshore Drive. And these substructures have substantial viaducts through them. And so here's a picture under the bridge along West Lawrence Avenue. And the, there again, the roadway on top is Lakeshore Drive. And there's going to be substantial repairs and maintenance uh, to this structure. If you look closely on the left side of the picture, there's a sidewalk that goes under the bridge. 
And if you look even closer, you may, you may see the outline of some tents. I know it gets dark under the viaduct there. But there's tents all the way along the left side on this sidewalk. And what you're not seeing on the far right side, another set of tents. And people are in the tents. And in fact, this particular, this one viaduct had 75 people in it. Uh, and so during this presentation, I want you to consider two thoughts. Uh, us, most of us are government employees. We're, in, we're here on an environmental justice webinar. We're an environmental justice practitioner. So what is my responsibility to the people in, the, in this viaduct? And what steps, what steps does Illinois DOT, what does the city of Chicago do? And, and so are these people in this viaduct an environmental justice issue? And when I first became aware of this project, you know, I was focusing uh, many of the resources that Fleming was telling us about, U.S. Census data, statistics, defining the project study area. I was asking myself, what's the definition of homelessness? What's the definition of a residence? Should these people be considered as part of the environmental justice community? So there again, just a little bit of background. The key takeaway on this, under that one viaduct, there were 75 homeless individuals. For all practical purposes, they were living in the viaduct. And so I kept asking myself, do I count these 75 people as being relocated as part of this project? Uh, Here's a picture of a representative of the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless meeting with the people. This is a picture of another viaduct not too far away from the other one. And in, there again, in Illinois, a project with 75 relocations, that's a, that's a big deal for relocating 75 people. And it's a big deal to 75 people are part of an environmental justice community. So uh, in this picture, uh, it's the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless meeting with the people. Uh, the Chicago Department of Transportation called the Chicago Department of Family and Support Services to find living arrangements for the people. And I kind of realized that I was cold-hearted and callous, and I was treating this as a numbers issue and not a people's issue. And so you know, I came to realize these aren't just numbers we're dealing with. These are real people. And this is kind of the, some of the issues that we dealt with on this, this project. So, and, and I'm really seeking the input of everyone on this phone, on this webinar today. But, you know, are the homeless an environmental justice issue? And you can go to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and find a definition of residence. Uh, you can see... There's something called the U.S. Census Bureau's residence rule to determine where people should officially be counted during the census. So a lot of the census data that we look at, the people that, I'm, uh, that we were dealing with in this did not show up on a census, but they're real people. And under this residence rule, people in certain type of facilities or shelters can be counted at that respective facility or shelter. And so there again, under this residence rule, people who do not have a usual residence or cannot determine a usual residence should be counted where they are on census day. There again, these aren't my words. This is the U.S. Census Bureau. So people at a soup kitchen, mobile food van, if they do not have a place to live and sleep most of the time, they, they can be counted at the soup kitchen or mobile food van, food van on census day. So, so we're asking the question, can the homeless person's residence be considered the soup kitchen or mobile food van location? So it appears for this project that we would count these people not as a resident of the viaduct or not as a resident of the transportation right-of-way, but of a nearby soup kitchen and not the viaduct. So the, the first step that we actually did on this was to contact the 
local government's human support services, which is in this case the Chicago Department of Family and Support Services. We also counted, uh, contacted charitable organizations and other entities that are involved, involved with the homeless. Uh, being compassionate, I, I could go on and talk about that for 10 minutes. I could talk about it all day. And then a key takeaway was resolving this issue took longer than 30 days. It took longer than 60 days. It's, it's basically taken many, many months. So uh, the, the question that I want to go back to on this are, are people that for all practical purposes are living in a viaduct, are they part of the environmental justice community? And what steps do we need to do to take? And we concluded in Illinois for this project we did not consider them uh, uh, as being relocated, even though in practical purposes they were being relocated. So I just throw that out there to this webinar. And, and, and this, there again, this is a brief case study. And actually this project is going to be the work, the actual construction work is going to be starting next week on this project. Uh, and so I just leave it there, and I'm going to turn it back over to the operator and to uh, the webinar operator. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. This is Melissa with AASHTO. Um, we have a couple of poll questions that we'd like to pose um, to the group that we'll run through right now. And then following that, we We'll open it up um, for discussion. I know we have a couple of members of our core um, EJ community practice group on the line, um, and we will uh, definitely make sure that we hear from them as well. So just one moment while we work through the poll questions. Okay, Trisha, I think we're ready for the first question. I'm so sorry, I actually have it up. Do you not see it? I just shrunk it back down. Well, I see the question, but I don't see a place to, oh, there we go. Does everyone see the poll question? Oh, yep. All right, thanks everyone for the um, for giving us those answers. I think we're going to move to the next question, um, and this one um, is about the types of tools and resources um, that you find most valuable when you're completing uh, environmental justice analysis. Um, it certainly isn't uh, uh, the, the items that we've listed there. Certainly, it's not an exhaustive list, but. Um, I think uh, we would appreciate your your um, view on that as well. So we're ready when you are, Tricia, for the second one. Hi there. Sorry about that. I have it up once again, but let me go ahead and bear with me. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Now available. 
Thanks, Tricia. I think one of the things that we found um, through our work last year is that uh, there's not always a consistent or standard process, and so that's one of the um, items that we were uh, talking about when we were preparing for this webinar, so we're happy to um, have this kind of feedback today, and then um, hopefully these questions and also the, the discussion that, um, or the case study that John ran through will also kind of spur some, some discussion here in a second. All right. I think we have one last um, very simple poll question, but it's to um, gauge uh, how much kind of interagency and um, interaction that the DOTs are having with the MPOs and vice versa or other um, organizations. Looks pretty even. Great. Oh, pretty, pretty perfect split there. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Trisha, for running through those poll questions. Um, so as uh, I think we can turn it over now to Jen, the webinar operator, um, to open the lines, Jen, for the discussion portion of the webinar. Yes, of course. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions or comments. You may submit a question or comment through the web by typing into the chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen, or you may ask a question over the phone by typing I'm sorry, by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypads. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question or a comment, please submit it via web or press star 1 at this time. Please hold while we poll for questions. And this is Melissa again with Ashto. Um, Gloria uh, or Sergio, I know you're both on the line and had, um, had some information to share. So while we open the line and kind of collect the questions, if, if either one of you would like to offer some comments, that would be greatly appreciated. And I do have a live question. Good morning. And our, qu our first question comes from Tim Foran from KYTC. Please state your question. Yes, we'd like to know what uh, was done uh, by Illinois in the case they presented. Th this is John Sherrill. I can go ahead and answer that. Uh, the, the case study, I made, I made it brief here, but uh, kind of this was one thing. We were not acquiring new right away. So this is right away that had been in possession of Chicago and partly IDOT for decades. Uh, so that was one fact. Another, a second fact is when we initially relocated or provided additional living for the 75 people, within a few days we had 35 other people move in. And there was a series of this going on for months where we would offer housing assistance, uh, and then people, other people would move into those areas, and uh, we, ultimately we went to court and we're, we posted a, and this is, there again, this is, it comes across as so cold-hearted here. So this was after many months and uh, over and over moving people out of, out of the area and we're going to be fencing it off here actually starting next week to physically keep people out of the area. So uh, it, it, there again, it comes across as cold-hearted, but it, and, and actually the, the area where they were living is, you know, there's falling concrete, open rebar. Uh, so, I mean, 
it, it was kind of an unsafe living area, but it, it's just been known. Mm-hmm. There's other areas of Chicago where the homeless live, like under Wacker Drive, if you're familiar with Chicago. But so it, my last bullet there about that it takes longer than 30 days, you, it took, it's taking months and months. And then finally a, uh, a court and us having to put fencing around the area to physically keep people out. John, this is Tim Foreman with KYTC. As a follow-up to that, we're curious if there was a a determination made of a disproportionate effect, and was that mitigated by the relocation of the original 75 homeless persons? That that that's a good question, and, and we we did not consider the 75 people being relocated. And there again, this sounds like a technicality because we did not consider them living under the viaduct or living in the viaduct. We consider their residents at nearby soup kitchens, which we're not impacting the soup kitchen location. And and there again, I'm throwing this out to the to this <laughs> webinar pr- professional community of environmental justice community. I really didn't have any. We didn't really have any guidance on this, and uh, but so we did not consider it uh, an environmental justice issue. Because we considered it a social justice issue, but we did not per se consider it environmental justice because we did not consider them as living in this transportation right away. Thank you. This is Gloria Jeff um, representing the MPLs. Um, Several things that I think are are worthy of mention. One is to acknowledge that this kind of exchange is exactly what the roadmap called for in terms of opportunities for the practitioners at both the state and the MPL level to get together and kind of wrestle with some key areas of challenge. Uh, The roadmap identified sort of what I'm calling the three most important challenges, which was the whole issues around data collection. And I think the case study in Chicago gives you a perfect example of where data collection doesn't always help you define what the problem is you need to address. The second sort of key area had to do with impact analysis. And again, The question is, is the impact on the transportation user community? Is it on the, quote, permanent residents of an area? Or is it um, really sort of the impact in combination on the quality of space or quality of life in an area? And then the final sort of key strategy area that uh, the case study as well as work that practitioners are facing every day has to do with mitigation strategies. Um, I think that <clears throat> the partnerships between the MPOs and the state DOTs, while it ranked fairly evenly in terms of a split between uh, in the poll question, that quite candidly it continues to point to one of the outcomes of the uh, roadmap, which is the whole idea that there needs to be closer contact, Um, while a nice statistical split of about 50-50 on yes and no, it would appear that the feedback from the participants that developed the roadmap, that that number should be much higher on the engagement side of yes. And we simply need to do more and more of that as part of our routine matter of doing business throughout the planning process and the environmental review phases of specific projects. Um, I guess my final word at this second is a question for John Shell, which is you mentioned that there were multiple times that there were residents uh, in that right-of-way that had to be relocated. I'm sort of curious, were they as you relocated one group, was the next group coming in because they now had an open space to go to or had the word gotten out that here was a way to get permanent housing by shortcutting the process? Yes. Or was there some third reason? 
and that, that thank you Gloria uh I don't think the word had gotten out that uh this was a avenue to get permanent housing or or because the a lot of the people that came back to put up their tent in the viaduct were people that they uh, uh, just to kind of a couple other little facts here the uh, we really didn't see hardly any minority. It was mainly just low income was the people. And a lot of the people that came back just were people that do not work well in a structured uh, housing situation. And they ended up living on the street versus in, in the housing that would be provided for them. So... Uh, uh, to answer your question then, so a lot of the people that came back are people that we'd already moved once or just people that are living on the streets of Chicago. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess this, this is John Sherrill again, and I guess the, the sad part is is uh, they're, they're real people. We're really relocating them. For all practical purposes, they are living in this viaduct, but through the quirks of definitions, I guess you could say, we're saying that they're not living there. But and there again, the you know if they were living on top of Lakeshore Drive, you, you can't live up there. You'd get run over because the the, the the average daily traffic is just continual 24/7. But under Lakeshore Drive, there's these open viaducts, open sidewalks uh, that people spend days, weeks, and months there. Thanks, John. Uh, this is Melissa again with Ashto, and I know, um, Sergio, are you still on the line? Um, I wanted to make sure that we have time um, to hear from you as well. Yeah, so just, hi, everyone. This is Sergio Rotaco. I'm a transportation planner with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. I serve the, we serve the National Capital Region Transportation Planning Board. Um, just really just two quick seconds, I guess, just to kind of to, just to give an update as to kind of what I was uh, thinking about talking to. Um, it, it's kind of a pivot from, from, from the conversations at this point, but um, I don't want to sort of take any more time other than to say that we at the Transportation Planning Board are doing a plan level analysis for our environmental justice requirement. Um, and I'll be speaking at AMPO in depth about sort of what we've been doing up to this point. Um, and it's a, a unique set um, in this world of environmental justice, the plan level analysis for, for, for the MPO. So I just want to kind of highlight that um, the analysis that we will be doing um, and sort of the work that really is involved, especially the, the public involvement piece that's involved with um, that level of analysis. So I don't want to take away any more time from, from the actual sort of discussion and Q&A that you guys have going on. Thanks. Thanks, Sergio. I'm glad you're able to participate, and thank you for the update. Um, before we take any more calls uh, or questions from the phone, I have a question that came up in the uh, text box, uh, John, and it's for you. Um, and I'll just read it to you. What would have been the consequences of considering – sorry. I lost it. Okay. What would have been the consequences of considering the homeless as residents that are displaced by the viaduct construction? Wouldn't the end result be the same in terms of relocating the people affected? You know, so this is John Sherrill with the Department of Transportation in Illinois. So if we had, uh, again, moving 75 residents is a big deal to a to a Department of Transportation project. Uh, the level of movement, the level of controversy uh, associated with this, uh, you know, it could have elevated. We, we did this as a categorical exclusion project. It could have raised it up to an environmental assessment where we had public meetings and various public hearings. So that from a NEPA viewpoint, it, possibly could have had to have been processed as an environmental assessment. The mitigation, uh, in my opinion, would have been the same, you know, that, that the city of Chicago 
Chicago Department of Transportation would have uh, made available public housing and other living arrangements uh, for the homeless. So the uh, mitigation, in my opinion, would have been the same in either either way. Thanks, John. Uh, we have a couple of other questions that came up in the text box for you as well. Um, first one is about the court case that you referenced in your presentation, um, and specifically what um, what was that relating to? The the court case uh, was related to the type of housing made available. Uh, there was a uh, nonprofit group that sued on behalf of the homeless, saying that additional way, a different, a different types of uh, housing should have been provided. So I, I know that's, in other words, the city of Chicago DOT, they uh, provided a list of places you could go, uh, temporary shelters, and the court case involved that additional type of facilities should have been provided. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have another one for you. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure others on the line might be able to, to weigh in on this one, but um, would a city's annual homeless cen uh, census be an acceptable data source for identifying homeless people's residents more accurately? Uh, possibly. It, it, I, we, we looked at different data sources on how much how many homeless are considered in a city and those are rough guidelines and really the best feel for it is and I give a lot of credit to the Chicago Department of Transportation uh, one of their bridge engineers he uh, he must he's been to the site oh, 10 or 15 times uh, to have meetings with the people and with the different nonprofit coalitions that represent the people. And it's really just that on the ground uh, meeting with the people that you need to do. Because uh, some of the people don't want to give their name. Uh, it, it's an oddity because there's 75, they're real people, you know, but they don't really show up in, uh, on data sources. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, John. Um, does anyone else have um, anything they'd like to add um, on any of those questions or discuss? And um, you know, if not, Jen, I think we can go back. If you have any other um, phone questions, I think we're ready for those now. Yes, of course. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad at this time. I have a question for. Um, Fleming, um, this is Gloria Jeff. Fleming, will the analysis course be uh, not only open to training for the folks um, who are practicing, but will there be an advanced course for SHWA division staff so that there remains consistency? or the opportunity for consistency in terms of how that analysis is viewed and um, encouraged by SHWA? Um, hi, Glory. Thanks so much for the question. Um, at this point in time, um, you know, we're, we're putting a lot into the development of, of this course, and um, we will um, actually, uh, you know, take a concerted effort to make sure our, our field staff take the course as well as some of the, the um, uh, complement, the, some of the resources that we're developing that will go along with, with the course. Um, that at this point in time, there isn't, I, I guess, anything in, a, in addition that we have planned at this, at this time other than, um, you know, we may hold a webinar to um, discuss, you know, the opportunity uh, to, to to, to enroll in the course, but also some of the other resources that we, we have developed. So we'll, we'll be doing some efforts to actually um, collaborate and coordinate with our, our field offices, but in terms of the analysis course specifically, um, outside of, we, we will also have a pilot of the course while it's in development, which will likely be sometime next summer. Uh, so we'll be working with our, our stakeholders to figure out where it would be a good place to hold that. Um, 
but in, in the interim, we'll, we'll continue through our, our uh, networking efforts, our, our work group, um, to inform our division staff. Uh, but the content will be consistent and uniform. Um, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll make all our uh, all efforts possible to ensure that our, our field offices are, are, are aware of the content. And also, uh, Gloria, just one other thing about that is that um, I, I know you and some others were involved in the develop or, or the participating on the technical oversight team for the development of the um, web-based course, which I spoke about. So there may, there's also an opportunity to provide input uh, for the analysis course as part of the uh, technical oversight panel, which we'll be looking to uh, uh, look for volunteers to serve on that panel. Hey, Jen, this is Melissa with ASHTO again. If you don't have any other uh, phone questions, I have one from the text box that I can ask. Yes, there appears to be no phone questions at this time. Okay, uh, one last question for the group. Um, the state of Michigan is not adding a lot of capacity, so we don't have many projects with potential for adverse effects in our program. What have other states that aren't growing doing to, going, doing to address the needs and concerns of vulnerable populations? And I kind of toss that one out to the to the group. Does anyone have any uh, experiences uh, around that? This is John Sherrill. If I can partly answer that question, uh, in there again, I work in a lot in the city of Chicago. Uh, we're, we're finding that uh, for vulnerable populations, you know, there, it takes many, many months to get their to get the participation and get meaningful involvement. You know, those are two catchphrases we use: meaningful involvement. But uh, we're working real close with our other transportation partners, meaning transit and rail, to. Uh, we have some horrible bus stops in Chicago. I mean, you almost, you almost get run over trying to get on and off the buses. So uh, we're continually looking to improve our transit stops uh, and add more transit stops. So uh, our regional uh, trans other transportation partners, they're again, I, I represent the state of Illinois and mainly roadways, but up in the Chicago area, we have other transportation entities uh, such as bus and rail and so we're continually looking to upgrade uh, those types of facilities transit stops add new transit stops we did a big study on transit stops getting to employment centers and so we were adding a lot of transit stops And, and this is Fleming. I just wanted to add that um, when we were uh, developing our uh, Fundamentals of Environmental Justice web-based course, one thing that we found that um, while there might not be a lot of major uh, transportation projects requiring an EIS, uh, a, a that scale of a project, um, there are a lot of uh, operation and maintenance issues related to um, uh, improving uh, aging infrastructure. And so that is where we've found a lot of emphasis in terms of uh, considering the impact on vulnerable populations and also that being minority and or low income. So even something simple as doing a um, resurfacing, um, if there's a, a, a equity analysis looked in terms of uh, improvement of, of sidewalks or um, if there's um, accommodations for other users in, in a roadway, that all that's kind of considered as it is applicable to, to benefits and burdens to uh, vulnerable populations and or uh, environmental justice populations. And we do have a phone question. Our phone question comes from Carolee Valcom from Washington State. Please state your question. Thanks. Yeah, this is Carolee in Washington State. I wanted to um, respond to Matt's question in Michigan just by saying um, some of the things that we're trying to do is really um, work towards 
the, the more inclusive community engagement so that we're reaching out to more communities. Um, we have lots of areas of the state where we're in a preservation mode, um, but the department is putting a, a major emphasis on um, recruiting a, a diverse workforce so that we represent and look and, and, and communicate with the communities that we serve in, uh, in, a, in a way that is more um, inclusive. Um, we're providing training um, throughout the department on inclusive community engagement uh, techniques, um, and we are kind of updating our approaches um, so that we're, whether it's a plan effort or a project-specific effort, we're, we're trying new things to, to hear the needs of all of the communities that we serve. So um, I'd be happy to follow up with you offline about that effort. Thanks, Carolee. This is Melissa. And we'll make sure that um, this might be a good question to kind of pose to some of our DOT practitioners as well. So um, we'll make sure that, that you're connected with Matt. And Jen, this is Melissa again. Are there any other uh, phone questions? Ladies and gentlemen, if you do have any questions, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. At the moment, we do not have a live question. Okay. Um, so we have, um, I just wanted to point out one uh, resource slide that we have um, on the screen right now with general information that you can find. Um, at the ASHO Environmental uh, Excellence, uh, the center's webpage. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, um, as we get the community of practice up and running, um, we certainly encourage all of you to, to be sure to reach out to us with any questions or suggestions that you might have. Um, and so our contact information is listed below. You can reach out to myself or um, Samantha. Her contact information is listed there as well as our colleague Brian Hong. Um, he also works on many of these issues. So we'd be happy to, to hear uh, from any and all of you. Um, and then um, we'll be reaching back out to everyone soon. Um, as we move forward, we will be um, calendaring uh, the future uh, engagement with this community um, in a more proactive way. So we're hoping to get many of the, the webinars or conference calls scheduled um, in advance. So um, you'll be seeing information about that soon. So I wanted to just um, put that out on your radar. Um, so that was kind of my closing housekeeping messages. And Jen, I don't know if there are any other questions. I certainly don't want to um, cut anyone off if there were some last moment questions. There's a few, there appears to be no questions at this time. Well, um, Hearing that, um, I want to thank you all again for taking the time to participate on this webinar and uh, speak for everyone here at ASHTO. Um, we are very excited about um, conducting this work over the next several months and um, look forward to working with you closely. And I, that concludes uh, the webinar. Thank you.